So our general statement is that when you got two distinct fixed points then the transformation is of the form w minus e, this is equal to k times z minus i1 over z minus i2. So that is a much more natural way of writing this Mobius transformation because it says take this ratio and then all you do is multiply this ratio by a certain number. This immediately implies something much much more interesting which is if you do this transformation over and over again. So let us suppose that you start with z0 and you make the transformation Mobius transformation it goes to z1 and it goes to z2. Uh, let us not use this notation, let us call this z0, z1, z2, dot 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 etcetera. Each time I make the same Mobius transformation, I repeat it, I iterate this transformation. Let us suppose that the original variable was z superscript 0 and after n iterations it is z superscript n. Then what is the n going to become? Well, you can write this transformation repeatedly and each time it satisfies this. So this immediately implies that z n minus i 1 over z n minus i 2 must be k to the power n z naught minus i 1 z naught minus i 2. So the problem of multiplying this matrix a b c d n times raising it to the power n is kind of circumvented by writing it in this form here. At the end of the day after you do all that algebra it has to be this, write this down. Okay. This is called the normal form of the transformation. This thing here is a normal form. And now you see why a transformation instead of specifying it by the coefficients a, b, c, d with a, d minus b, c equal to 1, you should really specify it by saying what is i1, what is i2 and what is the multiplier. These three together take care of what the transformation is. By the way, you have some more information here, you have a lot, of, lot more information. Let us solve for this guy, let us solve for z n. Let me, let me for a moment call this uh, number something or the other, call it a then it is clear that z n into 1 minus a uh, minus a z i 1 sorry I do not mean that. So let us write this out it says z n minus z i 1 equal to a z n minus uh, a z i 2. So it says z n equal to z. Uh, so let's write this out properly. It says z n equal to z one minus a z two divided by one minus a equal to z one minus k to the n z naught minus z i 1 over z naught minus z i 2 divided by 1 minus k to the power n z naught minus z i 1 over z naught minus z i 2. Okay. So it says after n iterations of this transformation any arbitrary point z naught goes to z n which is given by this formula here. Okay. Now you can see where it is going to go as you make n very large. As you make it larger and larger depending on whether modulus of k is bigger than 1 or smaller than 1 things are going to flow to different points. Suppose mod k is bigger than 1 and k remember we defined in this form this is the definition of k where xi1, xi2 are given to you explicitly. So incidentally we should write a formula for this multiplied k. So let us do that k equal to 
a minus c xi 1 and what was xi 1 if you recall it was equal to uh, a minus d plus square root of a plus d whole squared minus 4 over 2 c right divided by a minus c a minus d minus the square root a plus d squared minus 4 over 2 c the c's cancel out and you get 2 a minus a which is a plus d equal to a plus d. So, you have a plus d plus the square root which is the trace of this matrix. So, let us write it as just t, t is a plus d. So, it is t plus square root of t squared minus 4 over t sorry t minus this guy over t plus square root of t squared plus 4. So, very compact expression for the multiplier. The multiplier is just determined by the trace of that matrix nothing more than that and it is just this ratio. Now, once you have that in place, we can decide what is going to happen to this. So, the mod k greater than 1 would imply that z n as n tends to infinity. Remember, the z n is the iterate is the map after n iterations of an arbitrary point z naught. And where is it going to go? Well, this is going to dominate okay. and this ratio cancels out. So, the whole thing tends as you can see uh, there should be a xi 2 somewhere right. Yeah. So, xi 2. So, it says this tends to xi 2. So, what happens is under this iteration if mod k is greater than 1 and mod k is decided by this then every point on the Riemann sphere with one exception is going to fall into the point xi 2, the fixed point xi 2. What is that one exception? Xi 1 itself, yeah. Xi 1 is already a fixed point. So, if you start with that you cannot move out of that, but everywhere else things are going to flow into this point xi 2. So, I could call xi 2 a sort of attractor, it attracts points and xi 1 a repeller because points in the neighborhood of xi 1 are going to flow out of it into this xi 2. The next thing is of course, to find out what sort of flow is this and we will look at the classification, but it already tells you that some interesting things are going to go on in this exactly like in the case of discrete dynamical systems where you have attractors and repellers, stable fixed points, unstable fixed points and so on. So, something very similar happens here where n is like discrete time every time I iterate it is like one further time step. Oh, one point I forgot to mention is that this formula here is true for negative n as well. So, you could actually take this transfer take this transformation backwards the inverse transformation. So, you could set n to be negative a negative number integer and it will go backwards in time if you like. So, the inverse of a Mobius transformation is again an inverse transformation. So, it is clear that once you write it in this normal form the inverse map is with a k inverse sitting here and that too can be iterated in this case. So, in one shot you can look at not only forward iteration, but also the inverse transformations going backwards. Okay. What happens if mod k is less than 1? Well, the roles are reversed. In this case z n tends as n tends to infinity plus infinity it will tend to xi 1 because this term is going to get smaller and smaller and will disappear in the limit and the answer goes to xi 1. So, now xi 1 becomes the attractor and xi 2 becomes the repeller in this case. Precisely what path is followed will depend on the point z, but there are generic cases we will see that what happens really is a some kind of spiral. Okay. What happens if mod k is equal to 1? So, uh, this one is like an attractor 
and psi 1 is a repeller and here psi 1 is the attractor and psi 2 is the repeller. What happens if mod k is exactly equal to 1? Then it is in like an indifferent fixed point. It is like one of these fixed points which is neither stable, marginally stable, marginally unstable as you call it. It is a marginal fixed point and the flow is neither in nor out. Okay. You are familiar with this kind of thing in other contexts. For instance, if you look at the simple harmonic oscillator in dynamical systems and you look at the phase trajectories they are ellipses going around the equilibrium point, but that equilibrium point is a center. So, things do not flow into it or flow out of it. On the other hand, I put a positive friction constant, then everything will flow in an inward spiral into it, but if the friction constant has got the wrong sign, then energy is pumped into the system and it will flow out of it. So, this is like that, uh, like a center if you like. We are going to see what is going to happen if mod k is equal to 1. In particular, you could ask what happens if k is exactly equal to 1 and we will look at that too. Oh, all this is true when you have two fixed points, xi 1 and xi 2 distinct. Uh, suppose they are coincident, what happens then? Then when you have xi 1 equal to xi 2 equal to xi, this uh, is equal to a minus d over 2 c because now a plus d equal to plus or minus 2 in this case then the question is what does the normal form look like in this case. No? Turns out the little bit of work you can show that the normal form looks like 1 over w minus xi equal to 1 over z minus xi uh, plus or minus c. This will depend on whether a plus d equal to plus or minus 1 plus some constant here which I think is C. This is what happens when A plus D is exactly equal to uh, A plus D whole squared is equal to 4, but the fixed point is at some uh, finite part of the plane. Then this is the normal form. Okay. What happens if one of the fixed points is at infinity? This was the case when C was equal to 0. So, C was equal to 0 implied D equal to 1 over A and we had two fixed points. We had xi 1 equal to A B over 1 minus A squared and xi 2 was equal to infinity in this case and it was a linear transformation. This transformation was very simple. It was z goes to A squared z plus a b in this case and it is easy to see what is going to happen if you iterate this transformation over and over again. It is trivial to see what the answer is going to be. I am not going to write this down in this case. So, what is the normal form going to be here? There is still a multiplier. There is still a multiplier. So, the normal form here is going to be of the form W minus xi, uh, W minus xi 1 equal to k times z minus xi 1 and this k is A over d. This case. The multiplier reduces to this right here. In this case, the multiplier becomes 1 unity. And the last case was just a translation z goes to z plus or minus b when both fixed points are at infinity and then of course, we have a situation where z n. So, so, the last case was you had uh, c equal to 0, a equal to d. So, a equal to plus or minus 1. This implied that z goes to z plus or minus b implies z n equal to z plus or minus n b just shifts by n times each time. Okay. So, those are trivial cases, these two cases, they are just linear transformations, nothing much happens, but these two are non-trivial cases, this one and most important of all this. Okay. 
So, I would like you to work out and I have given that as an exercise what happens uh, asymptotically to points in these cases, what's, what does k do and so on. Okay. So, this uh, kind of classifies uh, all, all Mobius transformations. What we need to do is to find out what the flow lines look like and on what directions do they go, etcetera. There will be cases when things will move along latitudes in the Riemann sphere, there will be cases when they move in a little spiral towards a fixed point, etcetera. Typically, that is what would happen, things would move in a little spiral and so on. And the spiral has an interesting name. Uh, it turns out that these spirals are called loxodromes, and this is a Greek word which essentially means a curve on the sphere which makes a constant angle with the longitude line, lines of longitude. So, on the sphere you have these lines of longitude and I take a path which makes a constant angle with it and of course, it goes around in a little spiral. As you can see if this angle is 90 degrees then you are moving along a latitude, if the angle is 0 you are moving along a longitude, but if you are moving in between at some fixed angle here, this kind of spiral is called a loxodrome and these transformations are called loxodromic transformations. Okay. This term comes from the Greek, it is a navigation word because they would try to navigate in a given direction by making a fixed angle with the north star and that would tell us, uh, tell them where they are going. So, and the curve that you trace on the sphere is a loxodrome and since these iterates look like their points on a loxodrome, it is called a loxodromic transformation. Okay. But otherwise you have things which look like uh, the ones where you have mod k equal to 1, they are called elliptic transformations and so on and so forth. So, I will classify them, I will write this down explicitly. Okay. But this gives you an idea of how you approach this. So, the cr crucial input is the invariance of the cross ratio. That helps you to get to the normal form and once you do that, you have uh, immediately the consequence for these consequences follow. There are several other things which we will talk about such as the isometric circle and so on, but first I would like you to appreciate one point which is the following. Since W is A z plus B over C z plus D, it implies that dW, if we differentiate it, is uh, A, uh, what does it do? A dz over z. A over cz plus d minus, uh, well, let us do this slowly. Equal to cz whole squared and then you have uh, A d minus B c is a 1 over C z whole squared. Okay. So, the Jacobian of this transformation, the modulus of this in here is 1 over this mod squared. So, this thing here acts like a stretch factor or a contraction factor depending on how big it is. This will tell you whether dW is stretched or contracted in this fashion. So, there exists one curve which is neither stretched nor contracted and that is the curve which says C z plus d equal to constant equal to 1. What kind of object is this? On the z plane, what kind of object is it? It is a circle with center at minus d over c and radius equal to 1. Hmm? That circle will not will go to some other circle, it is certainly mapped to some other circle, but that circle is neither stretched nor contracted. Hmm? What will happen to points inside that circle? mod c z plus d is less than 1. So, 1 over that is greater than 1 which means points inside are mapped onto the w plane in a stretched fashion 
and points outside it are contracted in here whereas this itself does not change and this is called the isometric circle. What is this mapped into? Well, we know that circles have to be mapped into circles. So, it is mapped into some other circle in the W plane. What is it mapped into? I want you to show that it is mapped into the isometric circle of the inverse transformation. Remember, there is an inverse transformation here which tells you w, z is equal to dw minus b over minus cw plus a, and that is got an isometric circle which is minus, uh, minus cw plus a mod equal to 1. So, I want you to show that this circle is mapped into that circle. So, we will come back and look at the other properties of this isometric circle. And now, uh, let me also mention here the group theoretic connection okay, and tell you where this connection comes from because that is a very, very interesting topic. Look at the set of matrices A, B, C, D under matrix multiplication, four complex numbers. So, these are 2 by 2 matrices which satisfy A D minus B C equal to 1. So, all matrices A B C D on the com with complex elements which satisfy A D minus B C equal to 1, they form a group because all of them have inverses, they are non singular matrices and the product of any two such matrices is again such a matrix because determinant of A B is determinant A times determinant B whether or not A and B commute. So, they form a group and this group is called the special linear group in 2 on the complex numbers S L 2 C. Okay. Now, do you agree that if you give me these four numbers A B C D four complex numbers with determinant equal to 1, I have specified a Mobius transformation for you. Have I done that? Yes. So, can I say that for every 2 by 2 matrix with determinant 1, there exists a Mobius transformation? Can I say that? What happens if I change the sign of all 4 numbers A, B, C, D? The matrix changes, it becomes minus itself, right. What happens to the transformation? It remains the same. So, this means that there is no 1 to 1 correspondence between these two groups, but there is a 2 to 1 correspondence between the two groups. So, in the space of these matrices, this is S L 2 C, here are all the matrices in S L 2 C. Every point here is a matrix, 2 by 2 matrix, etcetera. And then here is the set of Mobius transformations. These are Mobius transformations on the complex numbers in general because we are later going to look at Mobius transformations with just real coefficients. But the correspondence between this and this is not 1 to 1, there is 2 of these guys go to 1 of this guy. So, there is a 2 to 1 homomorphism between these two sets, between these two groups. This thing here up to a sign is isomorphic to this and the way you say it is up to a sign is by introducing what is called a quotient group or modulo, modulo a group which consists of just 2 elements and that group those elements would be 1 0 0 1 and minus 1 0 0 minus 1. These 2 form a group among themselves as you can see there is an identity element the square of it is 1, the square of this is that this times that is equal to this, that times this is equal to this, that is it, it is a cyclic group of order 2. It is isomorphic to binary, the set of integers under binary addition. So, addition modulo 2, you put all the even numbers in one basket, all the odd numbers in one basket, call that one element and all the even numbers one element, even plus even is even, even plus odd is equal to odd plus even equal to odd and odd plus odd is even, right. That group is a cyclic group of order 2 and it is written as Z2. Okay. 
So, up to that sign this is isomorphic and this is the symbol I will use isomorphism that is isomorphic to the Mobius 2C. This group of transformations is the same as this group here. Uh, this has got another name. This is also called the projective group and it is written as PSL 2C. This P stands for projective. Both, this, uh, both an element and its minus are projected onto the same, uh, same object. Okay. So, there is a group property and of course, if you know the group properties of this, then we know a lot about the group properties of this uh, set of Mobius transformations. Hmm? The very intriguing connections. It turns out that uh, for every group, and I will mention a little bit later, I will talk about the parameter space of these groups. Um, a group like this, its parameter space is simply connected. Okay? In other words, if you look at the space of its parameters, that is some continuous space and every point on it you can go to every other point in an arc wise fashion and you can every closed loop on it can be shrunk to a point without leaving the space and that sort of thing is called a simply connected group. So, this group is called the universal covering group of this group here. It is a simply connected Lie group and this kind of uh, connection this homomorphism invariably leads to very interesting consequences for this group here. This one is easier to analyze because the space is simply connected, but the space of this is not simply connected it becomes a little more complicated. So, it is easy to look at the covering group find out what its properties are and use this uh, fact quotient property in order to deduce properties of this group. In this particular case this group SL2C also happens to be the covering group for another very interesting physical group namely as you know in 3 plus 1 dimensional space time we can make Lorentz transformations. We make Lorentz transformations of two kinds they could be inhomogeneous and homogeneous ones. The inhomogeneous ones means you would also shift the origin of space and time. The homogeneous ones means you would leave the origin of space time unchanged and either make rotations or boosts to other frames moving with constant velocity. And then among them you can ask are the rotations proper rotations or improper namely is the left handed coordinate go system going to remain left handed or is it going to change to a right handed coordinate system. So, if you do not include parity and things like that or reflections then you have the group of proper Lorentz transformations homogeneous Lorentz transformations. Among them you could ask are you changing the sign of time or not if you do not it is called orthochronous. So, the future remains the future for both frames and the past remains the past without getting interchanged. So, the group of homogeneous proper orthochronous Lorentz transformations that is denoted by SO3, 1 special orthogonal group in 3 plus 1 dimensions. This uh, special orthogonal means that the group is not m times m transpose equal to identity, but there is a metric sitting here which says that the time. Uh, the time component and the space component will have different signs in the metric. I will come back to this and talk about the metric. It turns out that this group and this group are isomorphic to each other. So, there is a very deep connection between something totally different you have a set of Mobius transformations on the Riemann sphere that turns out to be exactly the same group as the group of Lorentz transformations in 3 plus 1 dimensional space time. Okay. There are all these intriguing connections one has, and it is ex exploited. This kind of thing is exploited. Both of them have this uh, covering group here, same universal <coughs> covering group. Okay. Similarly, and I will just mention this later, we will come back to this. If you restrict yourself to real coefficients a, b, c, d, so I put a, b, c, d are real, all parameters are real they too form a group among themselves. You multiply two such matrices and they are unimodular, they too remain in the same group. This group is a special linear group SL2R 
on the reals. Okay. Once again it turns out that SL2R quotiented with Z2 is a set of Mobius transformations with real numbers alone, real A, B, C, D. They too form a group among themselves, a subgroup of the more general Mobius group. And again you have the same thing, SL2R quotiented with Z2 is in fact Mobius 2R. Now you could ask what is SL2R itself? What on earth is that isomorphic to if anything? It turns out to be isomorphic to the special unitary group. So let me just write this and we will try to prove this later. SL2R is isomorphic to the special unitary group 1 comma 1, pseudo unitary group SU 1 comma 1. So you write down all 2 by 2 matrices with complex entries which are not unitary but which satisfy u dagger g u equal to g and this g is the matrix 1 0 0 minus 1. They call pseudo unitary. It is a pseudo unitary group and this group is isomorphic to this group here. It also happens to be isomorphic to the group of canonical transformations in Hamiltonian mechanics of systems with one degree of freedom and that is called the symplectic group. So, this is also isomorphic to 2 comma r out here. So, at the mathematical level there are all these very, very interesting connections uh, between one and the other. Pardon me? No, 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 no. This is the isomorphism, but the more, uh, so if I quotient this with Z2 then I get Mobius 2 r. So, that is that is the connection between them. We will write down what is the most general matrix. We will see explicitly where this comes about. We will write down the Mobius transformation and look at what are these, what does this group do, what kind of matrices are there. So, in the process we will answer questions like what is the most general 2 by 2 unitary matrix, etcetera, what is the parameter space and what is the most general pseudo unitary uh, matrix of this kind. So, there are uh, they, this by the way has got many other uh, intriguing connections. It is also what is called the little group for the special group of special Lorentz transformations in 2 plus 1 dimensions once again. So, there are all kinds of uh, at the group theoretic level there are lots of intriguing connections between apparently very, very different things altogether. Incidentally, this, this connection here is used very much in optics, this, uh, this uh, connection here in what is called Lee optics, there is a whole field of uh, study which again um, points to very, very intriguing mathematical connections. We will touch upon some of these things, but what I will do next is to um, classify, is to look at the flow of these uh, transformations, what do these flow lines look like and then come back and point out where these uh, group isomorphisms come from. <coughs>